Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, The Full Assurance of Sonship. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee that we have direct access to thee, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Wilt thou speak to us through him in this hour, and take all the glory to thyself. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying in the 8th chapter of Romans and come to the 8th chapter and the 16th verse. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit. Now it's to be noted that the Holy Spirit does not bear witness to our spirits, that we are the children of God, but that he bears witness with our spirit. The assurance of our salvation does not depend entirely upon the external testimony of the Holy Spirit, but there is an inward conviction which belongs to us ourselves. We know that we have passed from death unto life. We have the inner conviction that we have become children of God. We find something within ourselves that turns outwards and upwards to God so that we find ourselves crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit's testimony joins this testimony of our own inner being, confirms it, so that at the mouth of two witnesses, the thing is established. Now the verb, beareth witness with, is a compound one, and clearly means that the Holy Spirit adds his testimony to that which the life within us now bears concerning our divine sonship. For by this stage of our spiritual development, we are no longer babes, but have grown up and have the consciousness of our spiritual maturity. We are aware of the spirit of adoption. We have the knowledge that we have been born again as the children of God, have been declared by God to be his children, and have been placed in the responsibility of our new position as sons. Even a newborn babe has an instinctive recognition of its own mother. I remember an instance in our own family that teaches this great fact. When one of our children was only a day old, the nurse at the hospital brought a baby into the room and laid it down on the bed beside the mother of my child. This baby let out some shrill cries, and a moment later the nurse came back with another baby, and this time our baby, and put it down in place of the first one. Immediately there was quiet and all of the instinctive movements of searching for the mother until the baby was satisfied. The baby had known its own mother unconsciously, instinctively, but beautifully and simply. It is thus that we know God our Father. John says in his epistle, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. It is with this inborn knowledge in the heart of the believer that came to us in the second birth, that the Holy Spirit joins his witness, showing us the ground of our salvation and the basis of our hope, pointing to the revealed word of God as the foundation of our faith and to the blood of the cross as the sure source of all our assurance and certainty. For he bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When Jerome came to translate the Greek into the Latin Vulgate, he rendered it, testifies to our spirit, as though the verb did not have its compound prefix. Perhaps his difficulty rose from the fact that the fathers before him were evenly divided as to the meaning of this verse. Origen and Theodoret held that the Holy Spirit testified to our spirits by producing obedience, love, and imitation of God, which are evidences of our adoption. But on the other hand, Chrysostom and Ambrose present the position which we have adopted and show that the work of the Spirit rises out of the fact that we have been enabled to come to God and call him Abba, Father, and that the Holy Spirit seals this testimony with his joint agreement. It is when men rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and continue in his word that they become disciples indeed, and the Holy Spirit, witnessing with their spirits that they are the children of God, can bring them into that truth which frees them from the bondage to any human leader. But how does the Holy Spirit communicate his joint testimony within us 
so that he bears witness with us of the full assurance of our faith. In other words, what is our spirit with which he witnesses? Through the centuries, there's been a great deal of discussion as to the nature of man's inner being. In spite of the variations of opinions and conclusions, we believe that it is possible to draw a clear picture from the study of all that the Word of God has to say about the matter. The story of our creation states simply that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now from this we conclude that man is a soul, that man has a body, and that man has a spirit. The body is the simplest part of man to study because it can be examined scientifically and studied in all its anatomy. We dismiss that phase of the study, reminding ourselves simply that the Holy Spirit inspired David to state that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When we turn to the study of man's psychical nature, the problem is quite different. In my early ministry in the late 20s, I received a letter from a mother who was worried because of the teaching that her freshman daughter was receiving in one of our great state universities. The mother enclosed the notes taken by her daughter in class of introductory psychology. The instructor was evidently a half-baked smart aleck, for he had been foolish enough to push his mechanistic philosophy to an absurd extreme. He said, you young men and women must realize that you are now in a university. This is not high school. You're going to have to learn to think like adults. Many of you have come from farms and small towns, and you have parents who haven't had the advantage of a college education. Many of you have been taught many things that you will have to unlearn. For example, some of you may think that you have souls. I would be very interested to see a photograph, even a micro photograph of a soul. True science does not recognize the existence of a soul, and as far as this class is concerned, no souls will be admitted. So if any of you think that you have a soul, please find a place to park it outside before coming in here. Now, it's hardly necessary to take note of such biased ignorance, for the professor himself would have found himself incapable of producing a photograph of his thought, or his affection, or of his will. A more scientific approach would have been to admit the existence of any force that can produce true results. If he is ignorant of the nature of that force, admit it and wait for more knowledge. The Christian, of course, has the divine revelation that is found in the Word of God. We can have certain answers that man cannot know by his unaided faculties. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. We believers, therefore, proceed with the supernatural aid which has been given to us and set forth the teaching of the divine revelation concerning the constitution of man's being. First of all, we must study the nature of Adam and Eve, independent of any study of their offspring. For the entrance of sin into the world produced a new set of factors which completely altered the picture. Adam and Eve had bodies which were created by God. They themselves are said to be souls, and they received spirits from the Creator. The bodies have five senses, and through these senses we have consciousness of the world round about us. We hear, see, taste, touch, smell, and these sensory perceptions are translated by our brains for use by the inner man, the soul and the spirit. Adam's soul and spirit were in an unfallen state. A careful study of the 1,683 passages in which the Hebrew and Greek words for soul, nephesh, and psuche, and the words for spirit, ruach, and pneuma, are very revealing. The soul is self-consciousness, and the spirit is God-consciousness. I have looked up every one of these 1,683 usages of the words for soul and spirit. We discover from a study of all of these passages that Adam's spirit had a true consciousness of God without any possibility of error, 
Adam's soul was his ego, his self. The center of the will is in the soul. And there it is that man makes his decisions governing his actions. The time came when Adam willfully chose to have his own way rather than God's way. This was the entrance of sin into the human race. What Adam's course of action should have been was a full yieldedness of his soul to the domination of the spirit and the knowledge of spiritual things furnished to him by that spirit. For we read in 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Here is the proof that the seat of the intellect is in the spirit. In unfallen Adam, the Holy Spirit was able to communicate with him directly through this human spirit. But when the will of Adam turned to itself, refusing the knowledge that his spirit had available from the Holy Spirit, the great catastrophe of the fall took place. Perhaps the best way to illustrate what took place is to create an analogy with a three-story building. We've seen pictures of the bombings in London, for example, in which the explosion had caused the third story to fall into the second story. The walls of that second floor gape with large holes which permit us to see the debris of the third floor fallen into the floor below. The first story has withstood some of the shock and still stands, though there are cracks in the walls and it can be seen that it is ultimately doomed to crash. Thus, it was with Adam. His body was the repository of his soul, and above that was his spirit. When sin came into his life, the spirit fell down into the soul, and the debris of the two became hopelessly confused, so that, as we consider fallen man today, it is impossible to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. It is for this reason that some theologians have attempted to say that there is no difference between the soul and the spirit. These men are known as dichotomists, while those of us who distinguish sharply between the soul and the spirit are known as trichotomists. I believe that it is biblically correct to say that both positions are right. The unsaved man has a body, and above that, a mixed-up personality that is the chaotic debris of fallen Adam. It is only in Christ that the soul and spirit are separated again. Let us look first at unregenerate man today. He is called by the scriptures the natural man. It is unfortunate that we do not possess in our modern languages an adjective for the word soul. For body, we have bodily. For spirit, we have spiritual. But for soul, there is no corresponding adjective. We need one, most definitely. The Greek has such an adjective, and it is translated by various terms in our versions. The natural man would be correctly rendered the soulish man. James also tells us that the wisdom of man descendeth not from above, but is earthly, soulish, devilish. It is therefore impossible for the unsaved man to know spiritual truth. Every religious thought that an unregenerate man ever had is false. Even when an unsaved man arrives at truth by natural thinking, it is false because it has error mixed with it, and it is contaminated by having originated in the soulish, sensual nature of man. Religious truth may be compared with a coin. We must be prepared to distinguish between the real and the counterfeit. And we must realize always that a counterfeit is dangerous in a direct ratio to the proportion of true metal that is in it. If someone should be an artist at carving and should duplicate a silver dollar in wood, it would deceive no one as a coin, except a moron or a child. If the counterfeit dollar is made of lead, it will deceive a few more people. If it has 20% silver, it will deceive many people, while if it has 40% silver, it will pass all but the most discriminating, and they must even be on the watch for it. 
There is some religious thought that is obviously counterfeit, even to the generality of civilized, unsaved men. Followers of animistic religion are obviously in a pit of degradation. Theirs is a wooden coin, fragile to the touch and manifestly fraudulent. But it is when we enter into the sphere of Christendom that the counterfeits become the more subtle. Here, the highest ethics of Christianity have been stolen by several false systems. In the one, there is the emphasis on the love of God and the goodness of God, with no mention of his justice and his holiness. In another, there is the imposition of a system to take the place of sovereign grace. All of these religions are the product of the fallen spirit of the soulish man, either from his own intellectual meditation or from the satanic spirits which have free access to the souls of unregenerate men. Soul and spirit, now inseparable because of the fall of the spirit into the soul and the churning of the two together through several thousand years of enmity against God, cannot be distinguished by any method of human thought. It is into a being like that described above that God moves in the new birth. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. We have been made partakers of the divine nature. We have been born again. Now, suppose that you could see in the streets of London, for example, a new third story brought down from heaven and put on top of the ruins of the bombed houses which we have described. This new story would not rest any weight upon the defective walls and broken pillars of the old edifice. We would see that the third story hanging there without any reference to the law of gravity. It would touch the framework of the edifice below but would in no wise be related to it. That is what happens when a man passes out of death and into life. A new nature, a divine nature, comes down from above and covers and touches the individual. It is a new spirit. We write it with a small letter, a new spirit, for it must be distinguished from the Holy Spirit, even though it is born of that Spirit of God. The initials are properly printed in our Bibles, where we read, That which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit, small s. Now we can truly understand our text in Romans, for the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The coming of the new Spirit brings with it absolutely new life and new knowledge. That new knowledge is perfect though this does not mean that the Christian becomes perfect. What it does mean is that we have the absolute perfection of God within our new nature, and that in the measure that our will, centered in our souls, will go upstairs to the life of God within us, we can bring absolute truth down into our being, and can walk in the light of that truth. No unsaved man is capable of having absolute truth brought into his being. He is the soulish man and receives not the things of the spirit. They are foolishness unto him. But he that is spiritual, he that has received the new spirit in the new birth, discerneth all things, yet he himself is discerned of no man. This we read at the close of the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now it's for this reason that the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, with all this in mind, we're able to get the fullness of the meaning of our text. The creation of the new spirit within the believer immediately brings the certainty of sonship. It is by this spirit that we call God our Father and Christ our Lord. It is by the word of God which is living and powerful and sharper than any surgeon's scalpel that we can penetrate even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and have all the values of the divinely given spirit to dominate our being. A century ago, the great Professor Hodge paraphrased our text, not only does our filial spirit towards God prove that we are his children, but the Holy Spirit himself 
conveys to our souls the assurance of this delightful fact. Now it should be noted that Dr. Hodge has stated that the Holy Spirit's witness is to our souls. Our renewed spirit witnesses down to our soul that we have become the children of God. And the Holy Spirit joins his witness with that of our spirit to give us this full assurance of sonship through Jesus Christ. The new version has a most interesting translation of this passage. Differing from all other translations that I have seen, it throws out the punctuation between our text and the previous one and makes them read, When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with my spirit that we are the children of God. It is thus seen that the work of the Holy Spirit is to engender true prayer within us. Phillips states it, the Spirit himself endorses our inward conviction that we really are the children of God. The more we read the word of God, the more we realize that the work of the Spirit is cumulative within us. He made us alive when we were dead in trespasses and sins, creating within us a new spirit. From this spirit, which is our very own, comes true faith Godwards and a testimony downwards to our souls. With this downward witness of our spirits, the Holy Spirit jointly testifies, while at the same time he sets in motion an upward flow of power so that we cry, Abba, Father. And this spiral of grace and fellowship shall continue forever. And our God and Father, we thank Thee that Thou hast given us these truths. We pray Thee that the Holy Spirit shall take them to each listening heart. If there be those who have not been born again, we pray Thee that Thou shalt give them restlessness till they rest in Christ. But upon all Thy believing own, may Thy grace, Thy mercy, and Thy peace abide, and a new sense of Thy joy in believing. And unto Thee be all the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power now, till our Lord Jesus come again and forever. Amen.